afternoon to you all. It is an honor to have you here this afternoon. And I would like to convey uh, to you all our heartfelt welcome to this brainstorming session on constitutional review organized by the right honorable Professor Mike O'Quiz, Center for Constitutional Studies at the IEA. I would like to assure you that your contribution at this seminar this afternoon will be paramount to the IAS project on reviewing Ghana's 1992 constitution to promote democratization, rule of law, and sustainable development for Ghana. I would like to recognize in attendance very important personalities we have here today. Um, on the podium we have, on the uh, high table we have uh, the right honorable uh, Professor Mike Okwe. We have the honorable Oseche Min Sabunsu, the majority leader, and we have honorable Hauna Idrisu, the minority leader. I would also like to recognize certain important personalities within the audience here this afternoon. We have Honorable Patrick Buama, MP for uh, Okai Kui Central. Honorable Fatima Du Abubakar, Deputy Minister of Information. Justice M. Short, former Chirag Commissioner. Mrs. Jean Mensa, Chairperson, Electoral Commissioner. Dr. Bosman Asari, Deputy Chairperson, Electoral Commission. Honorable Peter McMenu, former National Chairman NPP, and Honorable Kofi Ato City. I would like to introduce the chairman of this occasion in the person of the Right Honorable Professor Mike Okwe, the founder and the distinguished scholar of the Mike Okwe Center for Constitutional Studies at the IEA to give us his chairman remark. Thank you for. In fact, he has done very well to have extricated himself to come and take part uh, in this food. For which we are very, very, very grateful. If I may just lean on the protocol duly presented already by our moderator and particularly in our time the honorable majority leader and the honorable minority leader for their presence here it shows their commitment to the constitutional process and we appreciate that very very much we looking at our constitution as an instrument for good governance and development in such a way that we shall all be free, happy, under a constitutional era. We know the circumstances in which the constitution evolved in 1992. Actually, in 1991, only to become the 1992 constitution. And we also appreciate that a constitution being a living document, as duly declared by the Supreme Court, needs to be examined from time to time. We want to ensure that we so develop our constitutionalism in such a manner that forever and ever it will be an instrument for good governance and ensure that all those lacunae that may exist could be cured from time to time so that it will become better and better as we move on as a nation. This evening, therefore, we are particularly glad that the majority leader 
and the minority that it's very difficult to get both of them together except on the floor of the house you see i've duly agreed uh, to present this paper and a process which actually got strengthened when we all met together in Legon about a month ago and uh, had some other discussions on the Constitution. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the day is theirs. After the presentation, I will make a few remarks as chair, but I will not stand in their way. And I will therefore respectfully ask the moderator to introduce the two gentlemen for them to do the goodies for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we, as the Chairman indicated, we have two speakers of this afternoon engagement. And they are the person of uh, Right Honorable Osei Bonsu and uh, Haruna Idrisu, Honorable Haruna Idrisu. Um, I would like to introduce them in that order and I would give a brief uh, background of each of the speakers. Honorable Che, Honorable Che Mensa, <laughs> at this point, Honorable Che Mensa that you all know already. <laughs> Will, like, will take the podium from me. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Chairman, let me also float on the established protocol. And just to save time, uh, no disrespect to the distinguished invited guests here. The Chairman, taking a look at the topic for discussion today, which is the 1992 Constitution of Ghana, the perspective of a legislator. It is almost the same theme that I spoke to at the Great Hall of KNUST on the 12th of July, 2022. I guess the chairman considers my presentation there that it was a domestic conversation with local constituents in Ashanti. Or my alma mater, KNUST, or perhaps it was for the northern sector. I believe it's the reason why the IEA has invited me to share my thoughts with compatriots in the southern sector. But it's about the same thing that I did at KNUST. But it's good for me in the sense that I didn't have to begin afresh. I've just had to do a brushing up and a few adjustments in phraseologies and syntaxes. Otherwise, generally a restatement or a re-emphasis of my KNUST submission. As a member of parliament, I have since 2017 flagged the need to revisit the 1992 constitution. The 2022 annual action plan of the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs encapsulates this activity as the minister's priority area under the key issue, deepening democratic governance. This is because as a practicing parliamentarian, a parliamentarian of continuous 25 years experience, I believe I have some sufficient acquaintance with the 1992 constitution and therefore I'm properly primed to advocate for a review. I'm accused by my colleague, the minority leader, that the constitution is my second Bible. And he says to me the other day that even in my dreams, he sees me carrying the constitution. I didn't know that he's the, who is that man, uh, Prophet, is it Obini? I didn't know that he has transformed himself <laughs> into a prophet. Professor Chairman, distinguished guests, it has been three decades since the fourth Republican Constitution of Ghana was promulgated on the 28th of April, 1992. This constitution has endured and served the nation generally well, having successfully underpinned the fourth republic which is the longest democratic dispensation this country has enjoyed since independence. However, there have been numerous appeals for the constitution to be revisited. Many well-meaning and prominent Ghanaians have made suggestions for the amendment of the particular constitutional provisions 
and even a reconsideration of the suitability of our system of governance. Which is, which framework of government, that is presidential, Westminster, or a hybrid, would facilitate optimum development for a small unitary country such as Ghana? Three of our past presidents, President Rawlings, President J. Kufo, and President J. E. A. Mills, have all at various times spoken about the need to amend aspects of the 1992 Republican Constitution. The current president, Danado Danko Ekufuado, has also joined the fray of those who have been unambiguous and unequivocal in their advocacy for amendments to the Constitution. They cannot all be wrong. However, just like any other endeavor in life, there are some of our compatriots who are opposed to the idea of a review. Some notable Ghanaians, though in my considered opinion, uh, in the minority, have expressed the desire to maintain the status quo. As far as they are concerned, if it is not broken, you don't fix it. There are just others who opine that the spirit of the law must guide the conduct of the polity. Ghanaians, rather, they argue, need an overhaul of their values. In other words, something more than a constitutional review, a complete transformation or of the Ghanaian is required. Something more than a constitutional review is required. It's the reason why it has been said in certain quarters that the constitution has not failed, but rather as a people who have failed. My thoughts are simply that the preamble of the constitution establishes the mission of the republic. And it's, I'm quoting, the preamble provides, in the name of the almighty God, we the people of Ghana have established a framework of government to secure for ourselves and posterity the blessings of liberty, equality of opportunity, and prosperity. This we have done on the platform of freedom, justice, probity, and accountability, and based on the principle of universal adult suffrage, the rule of law, the protection and preservation of fundamental human rights and freedoms, unity and stability of our nation. Now, the sovereignty of Ghanaian people and the supremacy of the 1992 Republican Constitution are established by Article 1, Clauses 1 and 2. Article 3, Clause 4, commits the defense of the 1992 Constitution into the hands a court of all citizens of Ghana, and unless and until all citizens of Ghana elect to abandon that responsibility, the right and duty at all times to defend this 1992 constitution, the 1992 constitution shall continue to exist and be operational. Professor Chairman, Articles 1, and 1 to 3 constitute Chapter 1 of the 1992 constitution. Chapter 2 is on the territories or the areas that make up the geographical entity called Ghana. Chapter 3 defines who a Ghanaian is, whereas Chapter 4 covers what the laws of Ghana are. Chapter 5, which comprises clauses 12 to 33, is on the fundamental human rights and freedoms and the protection of same rights and freedoms. Chapter 6 provides the mission statement of the state captured as the directive principles of state policy. It is the policy encapsulation of all the overall development plan for the country expressed as political objectives, as article 35, economic act objectives, article 36, social objectives, article 37, educational objectives, article 38, cultural objectives, article 39, international relations objectives, article 40, and duties of, of citizens, article 41. Now the coalitions of these objectives should be the realization of basic human rights, a healthy economy, the right to work, the right to good health care, the right to education, as it's called 34-2, in the event an obligation is imposed by the Constitution on Parliament, the President, the Judiciary, the Council of State, Cabinet, political parties, as well as other relevant bodies, to be guided by the directive principles of state policy in taking and implementing any policy decisions which would culminate in the establishment of a just, united, free, stable, and prosperous Ghanaian nation underpinned by the transparent and accountable government referred to in Article 34.1 and indeed the preamble of the Constitution. Chapter 6 provides the mission statement of the state captured as the directive principle of state policy. It is the policy encapsulation as I've already said. Democracy is a representative government and in recognition of that, citizens are accorded the right to vote 
which is secured via registration for the purposes of public elections and referenda. That is provided under Article 42. It is therefore strange, Professor Chairman, for people to rise up and canvass the idea that every citizen of 18 years must be allowed to vote. Article 43 grants the right to Ghanaian citizens who are 18 years of age or above and are of sound mind to vote. But that right can only be exercised after one has registered as a voter. So if you are 40 years of age and you are Ghanaian and of sound mind, you cannot walk to a polling station to cast your vote unless you have your name in the book of life. That is the voter's register. <laughs> Professor Chairman, political parties are the vehicles for shaping the political will of the people to disseminate information, well, information that is well researched and appropriate, not propaganda, on political ideas, social and economic programs, and sponsor candidates for elections to any public office other than the district or lower local government units. That is Article 55. And that is why political parties themselves must get it right and themselves be populated by experienced, competent, efficient, and effective persons who can churn out ideas which have the potential of maximizing the rate of socioeconomic development to secure maximum welfare, freedom, and happiness of every Ghanaian and to provide adequate means of livelihood and sustainable employment to the Ghanaian people and public assistance to the needy, as provided under Article 36 of the Constitution. Professor Chairman, the anchor of the 1992 Constitution is provided by the framework of government which sustainably secures for the citizens of today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, the blessings of liberty, equality, opportunity, and prosperity. Now, the principal strands of the anchor are one, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, and the Council of State. Besides these, one can also identify other constitutional creatures, that is, independent governance institutions such as the Electoral Commission, the Media Commission, the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, the National Commission for Civic Education, the Public Services, comprising the Civil Service, Customs and Science and Preventive Service, Education Service, Judicial Service, Armed Forces, Police Service, Immigration Service, the National Fire Service, Audit Service, the Legal Service, the Parliamentary Service, Statistical Service, Health Service, Local Government Service, the Internal Revenue Service. We can also mention the government's statistician. Finally, one cannot be unmindful of the role defined for our chiefs under Chapter 22 of the Constitution. We have practiced the 1992 Constitution for, for close to 30 years now. Are the various strands firmly in place, effectively and efficiently functional, and contributing to the smooth functioning of the greater whole? Or is it the case that some of the strands are loosening up, or exfoliating, or even peeling off? Do some of the strands need tightening up, or repairing, or retrofitting? Now, I want to begin first with the perspective of a member of parliament on the executive. The president that the constitution has erected in Article 57 is the head of state, head of government, and commander in chief of the armed forces. The executive authority vests in the president, Article 58, and the executive authority of Ghana extends to the execution and maintenance of the constitution, all laws made under or continued in force by the 1992 Republican Constitution. Accordingly, all appointments into the public service are at the instance of the President, Article 195. The power to appoint persons to hold or to act in an office in the public services shall vest in the President, that is 195. Seeking to this provision, the President appoints the head of civil service, Article 1931, in the meantime, there is a conflict between Article 1947 and 171.1d with respect to emoluments. The President appoints, the persons, appoints persons to the Police Council, Article 201G and H, the IGP 202 Prison Service Council, 2061 and K, the Director General of Prisons, 207 Armed Forces Council, 211D, the CDS and Service Chiefs, Article 212, Fire Service, Shrag, Article 217, Commissioners, 
of the NCC Article 232, Media Commission 166, Governance Association 1853, MMDC is 243. The governing boards of various bodies and authorities established by various acts of parliament, the appointment of ambassadors, high commissioners, etc. We are still counting. All public lands are vested in the president, Article 257. Every mineral in its natural state, in order, or upon any land in Ghana, rivers, streams, water, but is throughout Ghana, the exclusive economic zone, and any area covered by the territorial sea continental shelf is the property of Ghana is vested in the president, Article 257. This certainly is a monarch that the constitution has created. The rest of us, of us citizens hold him in awe. And if and when he strays, it is difficult to talk straight to the president. Kofi, am I lying? <laughs> this arrangement needs to be revisited. It cannot be good for the growth of our democracy. The country needs a head of state and government. Therefore, at any given time, we shall have a president or a prime minister. There is an empirical study conducted by the World Bank which suggests that small unitary countries are better served with prime ministers as, he as heads of state than president. The president has the whole country as his constituency, whereas a prime minister operates from his or her own small cell. When the parliamentary leader wins and his party wins majority of seats in parliament, he becomes a prime minister. His campaign pace is very lean as compared to the president's campaign wardrobe. Of late, the electioneering campaign funds of contestants at every level of political arrangement has been escalating. The campaign funds of parliamentary candidates from primaries to national elections is averaging $600,000. That is according to the research conducted by CDD in respect of events culminating in the 2020 elections. That is huge. We are yet to begin the counting of notes in the lead up to the 2024 elections. But the campaign pairs of a presidential candidate from party primaries to national elections by any proper reckoning and accounting cannot be less than the equivalent of at least $50 million. Where do the candidates have such money from? There is a nexus between huge campaign expenditure and corruption through the award of contracts. As a nation, we must confront this. Do we need this expensive structure? Of government in the present or a, mass, a much lesser evil in the form of a prime minister who is as well much more accessible and accountable to the representatives of the people. We have a choice to make. In a strict presidential system, ministers are appointed from outside parliament. Invariably, they are all technical persons in the various fields who, when they, become, they come to be appointed, are able to assist the president in the determination of policy of the government that is as required under Article 76 2 of the Constitution and also for the efficient running of the state as captured under Article 78 2. These are experts, they are technical people, they are professionals who add value to governance. In the Westminster system, the Prime Minister appoints ministers for the same purpose the determination of the general policy of government and also for the efficient running of the state. The ministers in the Westminster system are not necessarily technocrats, but they are often long-serving members of parliament who must have served on committees for some time, risen to chair the committees, or perhaps served as shadow ministers and acquainted themselves with all matters pertaining to particular ministries, departments, and agencies, such that they might have become authorities in matters concerning the various MDAs. When such persons get appointed as ministers, there is manifest value addition unlike what obtains in our fourth republic, where because of the hybrid system of government that's been operated, the president is compelled to appoint a majority of ministers from parliament. That is as required under Article 78.1. Ministers of state shall be appointed by the president with the prior approval of parliament. From among members of parliament or persons qualified to be members as members of parliament, except that the majority of ministers of state shall be appointed from among members of parliament. You are witnesses to what obtains in such agreement. Many ministers, deputy ministers, who get nominated and who appear before the appointment committee of parliament when asked fundamental questions relating to their designated ministries would respond. 
Mr. Chairman, I don't know, uh, but please, you approve of me when I get there, I shall learn. <laughs> How are such persons, rudimental learners, going to assist the president in the determination of general policy of the ministries, the superintendent, or indeed of government? How are they going to help in the efficient running of the state? This is one principal reason why, as a nation, we are marking time. We are stuck because many of our ministers, approved by various presidents, do not have value to governors. I'm not here talking about the current MPP administration. I refer to all administrations since 1992. The time has come for us to mend and amend. Hasn't the time also come for us to place in the Constitution an upper ceiling of the number of ministers of state? and indeed of cabinet ministers. I've already stated, cabinet ministers assist the president in the evaluation of policies. All bills agreements are presented to parliament, are underpinned by government policy and principles which cabinet ministers propose to cabinet. If you are not a cabinet minister, you are not part of this process of the evolution of policy. That means that a minister who is not a cabinet minister cannot assent or present a bill or agreement to parliament if that minister is not a cabinet minister and therefore is not part of the process, the process of formulation of policy and principle. In that, if that is the case, as, as I believe that is the case, why have such a huge number of ministers in the first place? The constitution provides there shall be a cabinet which shall consist of the president, the vice president, and not less than 10 and not more than 19 ministers of state. Given the role of ministers of state, who cabinet ministers are, as for the running of the state efficiently and assisting the president in the determination of policy for his government, this is my contention that apart from the regional ministers, the number of central government ministers may not have to exceed 19. And, by, and that means ministries shall also have not to exceed 19. All ministers to be relevant and to be able to assist in the evolution of and determination of policy in their sectors must be cabinet ministers. The excess numbers must be cut off and would significantly reduce public expenditure. But I have of doubt, I believe the constitution must provide for that. Because parliament is not insisting on this, so the constitution must provide for that. Now, Article 68 provides among other things, whenever the president is absent from Ghana or is for any reason unable to perform the functions of his office, the vice president shall perform the functions of the president until the president returns. That's Article 50, 68. That construct means that whenever, whenever the president is absent from Ghana, it must be construed that he's unable to perform his functions as a president. Does the mere absence of the president from Ghana mean inability to perform the functions of his office? This cannot be true in this technological age or in situations where the president exits. The jurisdiction is capacity as president to perform official duties for the country, for instance, at the United Nations, at ECOWAS, or at AU, or to engage other presidents in bilateral discussions in foreign countries. We need to amend this provision as well. Now, Article 78 provides for the president to appoint a minister of state with the prior approval of parliament. When a minister is nominated by the president for a specific ministry, he's vetted for that ministry. If for any reason the president has to move that, that person to another sector, parliament must have the opportunity to vet that person again for that new position in order to satisfy, satisfy themselves that the person has some competence and knowledge for that new designation. Otherwise, we may wake up one day to see that a minister has been appointed for horticulture, and the next day is reshuffled to finance. Kofi, those, that is coming from you. I think it would be better for us to be able to assess the competence of any minister or deputy minister if that person is reshuffled in the court of parliament via the appointment committee. Ministerial appointment is a serious business and should not be reduced to try and error because government is about the lives of people. The Attorney General, who is a principal legal advisor to the government, is a Minister of State, appointed by an incumbent president, Article 88.1. The Attorney General is responsible for the initiation and conduct of all prosecutions of all criminal offenses 
Article 8A3, all offenses prosecuted in the name of the Republic of Ghana shall be at the seat of the Attorney General or any person bearing the authority of the Attorney General. If the Attorney General is a minister in a ruling party's government, certainly human as he is, he will tend to treat his colleague ministers with kids' gloves and only go after opposition elements and former ministers. It is proper and prudent to insulate the Attorney General and ensure his independence. For instance, the status of the Gen Attorney General could be made equivalent to that of the Chief Justice or at least a Justice of the Supreme Court. He must not be a Minister of State. By that, he will traverse several administrations and his financial autonomy will be guaranteed and then shall we witness the demonstrable prowess and power of an Attorney General. An amendment, in my view, is required for Article, Article 88. The National Development Planning Commission is a vital cog in the development agenda of this country. The broad architecture of national development is provided by the directed principles of state policy expressed in the broad ambit of political objectives as also related to political, um, educational, social, economic, and so on and so forth. And NDPC is mandated to craft a long-term development plan from these development themes for the nation <clears throat> based upon which the various political parties are required to craft their manifestos. That's called 55.3. When this has been achieved, then the relevance of Article 30, 35 7, which provides that as far as practical, I'm quoting, a government shall continue and execute projects and programs commenced by the previous government shall be established. This has become difficult to achieve because the political parties have no guide from the NDPC. On the part of the NDPC, it is not for want of trying. The truth of the matter is that the very composition of the NDPC provided under Article 86, makes it politically tainted. It's populated by ministers of state at a given time. And regardless of the quality of its product or content, succeeding administrations, which comprise of different political parties, may abandon the product to begin their own enterprise. Professor Chairman, I believe this is one area that we have to look at again. An electoral commission, that is, this is a body that occupies a central role uh, in the framework of government that we have established. Its commissions or omissions could either advance the cause of our democracy or draw us back. It is the responsibility of the Electoral Commission, and I'm quoting, to demarcate electoral boundaries for both national and local government elections, Article 45B. The Commission is charged with the function I'm quoting, to review the divisions of Ghana into consistencies at intervals of not less than seven years or within 12 months after the publication of the enumeration figures after the holding of a census of population of Ghana, whichever is earlier, and may, as a result, alter the constituencies, Article 47, Clause 5. It is the combined effect of Article 45B and 47.5 which drives the creation of additional constituencies by the Electoral Commission without any regard to Article 47.3, which provides, and I'm quoting, the boundaries of each constituency shall be such that the number of inhabitants in the constituency is as nearly as possible equal to the population quota. It cannot be that this becomes the resort of the Electoral Commission to be increasing the number of seats in Parliament any time they come to review the, the, the division of Ghana into constituencies. This practice is not sustainable and does not exist anywhere in the world of the established democracies. At the inception of the 1992 constitution, the, the constituencies in this country total 140. Then just about um, five months before the conduct of the 1992 um, elections, it saw an increase from, the number of constituencies saw an increase from 140 to 200. An additional, an overnight addition of 60 constituencies. A jump in the numbers by 60. That's an increase of 43 percent. Now, in 2004, the number of seats in parliament was increased by 30, from 200 to 230. And in 2012, Eight years after the second exercise, the number increased by 45 to the current number of 275. It is now over 10 years. And the census has been conducted in 2021. It's been more than 12 months since that census was conducted. It's easy to increase 
the number of seats or not. That's our dilemma. And to be honest, the people who stood to benefit from the last one now are having serious introspection. They think that the EC should not increase the numbers. But I think this is something that the Constitution must address. And I think I have held a view that we didn't need to have increased the number of seats from 200 to 230 and now 275. Going by the trend, perhaps one will say that it should go to 300 or 320. But is it, is it fair to the state, the resources that we have, and so on and so forth? Again, the composition of the Electoral Commission excites a lot of agitation. On some occasions, the agitation is muted. On other occasions, the agitations are very loud, depending on which political party is in opposition, which party is in government. And of course, which pre party's president makes appointment of the members of the commission. Should it be subject to prior parliamentary approval? Should the commissioners be appointed to serve a defined tenure? Should the commissioners include party officers? I submit that the time has come to look at this as a matter of urgency. Elections have the potential of triggering strife in many African countries. We should not allow any negative incident to happen before we rush to firefight. Now, the legislature, parliament, the core functions of any parliament are representation of constituents to deliberation of matters that come before the house, information, dissemination, legislation, power of the press function, oversight, ratification of treaties, conventions, protocols, agreements, including loans, etc. These are either, all these are not provided in our constitution. These functions, representation, the function of deliberation on matters, uh, even the power of pairs function. How many, how many of us have looked at the constitution to realize that the job that we do, and we are soon going to apply ourselves to it, that is scrutinizing government budget and approving of them. The constitution, the 1992 Republican constitution does not assign that responsibility to parliament. It only talks about a mid-year review and supplementary estimate, that we should approve supplementary estimate. The main budget, we're not giving that function. Surprisingly, I believe that that was really an oversight from those of them who crafted the constitution at the time. I'm talking to you. <laughs> so we should be looking at this. The second matter that should also concern us is the mode of choosing members of uh, the members of parliamentary candidates uh, by the various political parties. And I think the political parties must do serious introspection and look critically. In the established democracies, at the end of every term of parliament, five year, four year, or even seven year, the sluice gates are not opened to allow for unfettered contest. It doesn't exist anywhere. The parliamentary parties are given the responsibility to assess the performance of the members of parliament. And for those of them who operate optimally and bring value to bear in the functions of parliament and indeed of parliamentarians, the assessment will bear them out that the, the recommendation to the parties should be that they should be continued in office. Today, as we speak, over 50% of the current membership of parliament are new members. How do you grow parliament that way? You weaken parliament before the executive. And the executive then can have their way because parliament doesn't have the wherewithal to be able to stand up to the executive. We have a parliamentary service board. Unfortunately, the minority leader and I are added them. For whatever reason, the parliamentary service board established by Article 124 has no bearing on members of parliament. It relates only to the parliamentary service, as the staff, not the members of parliament. However that was done, nobody knows. It's one area that we have to look at again. And then the imperatives of Article 108, in the considered opinion of many, seek to forbid Parliament in the exercise of arguably its prime function legislation. Parliament since 1997 has been endeavoring to find its way around it. It all started with Right Honorable Peter Lajete, but his efforts did not yield much sense. Not too long after the exercise that he started, presidential and general elections came to be held, and his own party did not repeat him as the speaker. 
the chairman for this occasion, Speaker Professor Aaron Michael Quay, was the one who opened the vista by his own bold statement and subsequently allowing the consideration in passage of a couple of some amendment bills. The Speaker of the Eighth Parliament is proving to be much more adventurous by allowing the presentation of fully fledged bills by members of parliament in their private capacities and not on behalf of the President. <laughs> Article 108, however, provides, and I quote, Parliament shall not, unless the bill is introduced or the motion is introduced by or on behalf of the President, A, proceed upon a bill including an amendment to the bill that in the opinion of the person presiding misprovision for any of the following. Um, in position of a charge on the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana or the alteration of any such charge otherwise than by reduction. And, and two, the payment issue or withdrawal from the consolidated fund or any, the, any other public funds of Ghana of any monies not charged on the consolidated fund or any increase in the amount of that payment issue or withdrawal or proceed upon a motion so and so. I think it's just replicates. Now, the question then to ask is, because of this avalanche of private bills, and some people are even providing amendments to the Constitution, and they are allowed by the current speaker with no malice to him. But the, the, the question is, given the avalanche of substantive private members' bills and the substantive motions in relation to bills that have been introduced in Parliament, the questions that arise are, the, does the current speaker not have any opinion on these substantive bills? Two, or is it the case that the speaker opines that these bills shall not impose any charge on the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana? And if not, how are the bills after passage by Parliament going to be funded? or be implemented? What is going to be the effects of these bills if Parliament passes them on the budget that has already been passed? Is Parliament, in the face of the imperatives of Article 108, deliberately setting itself on a collision course with the executive? And I think that even though Parliament must be liberated to exercise its legislative powers, there should be a policy regulating how it should be done. It shouldn't be a free-for-all enterprise. Notwithstanding the express provision of 108, the legislative responsibility of Parliament must be discharged, as I've said. Because the, co the Constitution in Article 103 3 provides, committees of Parliament shall be charged with such functions, including the investigation and inquiry into activities and administration of ministries and departments, as Parliament may determine. And such investigation and inquiries may extend to proposals for legislation. So indeed, Parliament is provided with that responsibility. How to exercise the responsibility is the issue that I'm raising. Now, immunity from service of process and arrest. Lately, some wranglings are dominating. Some, some members of Parliament have had encounters with the law, enforcement agencies. Previous speakers have had a way about it. Lately, some wranglings are dominating the airways re regarding uh, witch hunting. In the face of Article 117, we provide civil or criminal process coming from any court or place out of Parliament shall not be served on or executed in relation to the Speaker, a member of, or the clerk to Parliament whilst on his way to attending at or returning from proceedings of Parliament. What should be the appropriate defined path for MPs who breach the law? We must, not, we must sort this one out in a better way to prevent what others may refer to as unwarranted damparic intrusions. <laughs> the Constitution must be amended to push, to punish wrong, whilst at the same time protecting the dignity and immunity of lawmakers. The financial autonomy of Parliament is something that we should be attending to because the Constitution grants financial autonomy to the judiciary and the Auditor General, but not to the other arm of government, which is Parliament. Of course, if there should be an un, unguarded or unguided financial autonomy to Parliament, it becomes difficult. Because whereas the judiciary have financial autonomy, it is for Parliament to, to oversee the activities. The Auditor General will oversee the activities. If it's down to Parliament, what happens to Parliament? who watches the watchman. But we must still have a way about it. 
otherwise. And I guess, while I was talking about financial autonomy, the Electoral Commission is one, is one constitutional body that must also have financial autonomy. Because you can have a very capricious president who may decide to stifle the conduct of activities and business by the Electoral Commission. And they may, they may not be able to deliver. So we must look at this. And gratuities to Article 71 office holders. Article 71 provides for the president to determine the salaries and allowance payable and the facilities and privileges available to um, officers listed under Article 71. Whilst parliament makes a determination in respect of the president, vice president, chairman, and other members of the Council of State, members of state and deputy ministers upon the recommendations of the committee that is established by the president. Those amounts are gratuities, not as gratia. Gratuity is a sum of money given for a good or long service. As gratia are amounts that are given for a favor. What we do are of favors. We earn them. It's gratuity and not as gratia. There's a world of difference. All presidents have established these articles. 71 office holders and monument committees, the outcomes have always caused national uproar. Does the establishment have to be ritualistic? Or is it the case that one president can establish, say, and will build in triggers to affect succeeding administrations? The time has come for us to look at it again. The Supreme Court, the highest court of the land, comprises the Chief Justice and no less than nine other justices of the Supreme Court. The upper limit is not set. We have seen instances where numbers have shot up to 14, 15. I guess the time has come to prevent any absurdities. Let us set an upper limit in the Constitution. Say the Chief Justice and not more than 12 or 14 others, and that would avoid even numbers and split decisions. For the qualification criteria of justice of the Supreme Court, the apex, apex court of the land. The Constitution provides under Article 1284, a person shall not be qualified for appointment as a justice of the Supreme Court unless he is of high moral character and proven integrity and is of not less than 15 years standing as a lawyer. Just that. Just that. Undoubtedly, in my view, the bar is too low. Check out the qualification and eligibility criteria for parliamentarians and other public office holders, such as the EC, NCC, Shrag, Public Service Commission, and so on. The bar is much higher there. Yet those officers are likened to the justices of the Court of Appeal in their conditions of service. Yet the qualification and eligibility criteria is much, much higher than the justice of the Supreme Court. Article 1284 has to be amended to whom much is given much indeed is expected. And need I say that Article 126 of the Constitution provides for the composition and mode of exercise of the power of the judiciary. Article 126 um, states, the judiciary of Ghana shall, that is, it must, it must consist of one, the superior courts of judicature comprising the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, the High Court, the regional tribunals, Kofi, where are the regional tribunals? You, you put it there. <laughs> the regional tribunals are still a composite part of our superior courts. But I thought the tribunal system, peoples or citizens, died with the revolution. Their ghosts, are still, their ghosts still exist in the Constitution. Indeed, more ominously, the Court of Appeal is allowed to hear appeals from the regional tribunals, however constituted. Article 1311. Article 142 establishes and composes the regional tribunals, and their jurisdiction is defined under Article 143. We simply need to uproot the regional tribunals, root, stem, and branch from the judicial system. That means that the chapter on the judiciary has to be amended. Now, the Auditor General. The Auditor General is a tool for Parliament everywhere in the world. The performance of Parliament's financial oversight responsibilities. It is the reason why the Constitution provides for the Auditor General to submit his audited report to Parliament within six months after the immediately preceding financial year, Article 187.5. It is strange, therefore, that in the Constitution of Ghana, the Parliament of Ghana, which the Auditor General works to, cannot request the Auditor General to audit 
in the public interest, the accounts of any public office or organization, but strangely, the president, the executive, that parliament provides oversight for could do that. That power is granted to the president via Article 1877 and 1878. That indeed uh, is an inversion, and it must be corrected in any constitutional review. The works of the Auditor General is not completed until they submit their report to Parliament, which through its Public Accounts Committee begins to interrogate the findings contained in the, in the report. Therefore, the situation where Auditors General, their reports before um, they are submitted to Parliament, gets leaked to the press for people who are cited to be torn into shreds. It's most unfortunate and very unprofessional. Professor Che, tolerate me for just a few more minutes. Article 286 of the Constitution provides for certain categories of public office holders to submit to the Auditor General a written declaration of all properties or assets owned by or liabilities owed by the office holders, whether directly or indirectly. The purpose for declaring assets and liabilities is for taxation and also to ensure that the person has a clean bill of health and that assets do not ensue from money laundering or ill-gotten wealth. But not so in Ghana, where assets that are declared are kept under lock and key by the Auditor General. It explains the reason why a person boldly declares, oh, that, as the last count, I, 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 I have, uh, the last count, he said he had 150 houses. Where are those houses located? What's the value of those properties individually and collectively? How much property rates has that person paid to the various district assemblies where the properties are situated? The Auditor General must have the capacity to go into this, and yet, you declare the assets and uh, put it somewhere. And some people even say to us that people who occupy public places in the assets declaration form would fill his own anticipations. He will tell you that when he has one house, he say that I have five houses. And he worked towards acquiring five houses. <laughs> Another person on television declared that he has much more gold bars than anybody in Ghana. <laughs> The tax authorities elsewhere would have immediately descended on the on that person. Yet nothing happened. Is GRA sufficiently empowered? Because, because the constitution provides that the um, minerals in their natural state, everything is based in the present. You go and mine. The mining and minerals laws provide. Now, once you get a mineral, gold, diamond, or whatever, the country has preemption. Whatever you uh, whatever you get, you declare to the state for the state to purchase from you. That's the law. These galamsayers, you know, they get everything. The state doesn't know anything about it, and then they smuggle them out. So, when the law provides that it's vested in the state, what benefit is coming from the state? They degrade the land take the money away, and the nation is the poorer. It's the reason why, on the books, here in Ghana, our gold exports in the region about 2.2 million ounces. And yet you step out, and the fact of the matter is that it's in the region of about 7.5 million. Where are they going? Where, where, how do we account for them? Who pays what tax and royalties? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I have my minority leader here. Sometimes when I'm overly loquacious, he says I want to render him, reduce him to a minority voice. So I'll soon end. But there are many other matters that we should concern ourselves with. The district assemblies. You know what? One of the good things that is providing insurance to us in this country is the decentralization that we are pursuing. In the other countries um, contiguous to our republic, the, I don't want to mention names, but central government is far removed from the rural communities. Here by our practice, 
We're standing governance to the doorsteps of the rural rise. And in my view, it's something very good that we have done. We must deepen it. And when on occasions where we cannot transfer the digital assembly common funds to the district, it becomes a bit problematic. Because where there's poverty, these people uh, would feed on poverty and poison the atmosphere for central government and take over. We don't want that to happen. Let's ensure that the proper things are done. Uh, we have the transitional provisions, almighty transitional provisions. We are saddled with it for so long a time. What do we do? I think the time for us as a nation has arrived. Let's look at that. And I believe uh, we can go into it and then do what is right. Finally, the amendment procedure of the Constitution established. Four and twenty provisions are both tortuous and torturous to say the least. Many of the provisions we have related to are entrenched provisions, and none of them shall require a referendum of yes or no, any one of them. With regard to the non-entrenched provisions, the amendment path is not serenaded by legato. It requires painstaking efforts, and the exercise could also suffer political twists and turns, as happened in the attempt to have district chief executives elected by universal adult suffrage. So, Professor Chairman, I believe uh, I've not in any way exhausted the issues at stake. But what I've done is just to provide um, some meat for us to chew on. I must express my, grat my profound gratitude to you, to you all for tolerating me for so long. As I said, there are many areas that I've not been able to touch because of lack of adequate time. However, I want to believe that I provided some food for thoughts on the subject the need for a constitutional review. Once again, I thank you very much, and I believe in the coming days and weeks, it should be possible for all of us to digest or to subtract from what ideas that I've shared. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Honorable Jose Chairman, sir, Bonsu, for your eloquent elucidation of sessions of the Constitution and identification of weaknesses thereof. I think indeed, you have provided a lot of us for us to chew on when it comes to the discussion time. But at this time, I would invite our second speaker, uh, the Minority Leader, Honorable Hawuna Idrisu, to also give us his view of the Constitution. <laughs> my Koke and chairman for this occasion, my colleague in whom sometimes I'm pleased, but certainly not today, <laughs> the majority leader, deputy minister, and doctor, I should thank you for those warm introductory words. Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, I was sharing a pleasant joke with uh, Dr. Charles that I used to be an associate here, not in the standing of Professor Michael Quay, but at least as your policy expert with the Institute of Multiparty Democracy. So it's nostalgic coming back to the IEA to discuss matters of constitutional review. I should thank Professor Michael Quay and in particular the IEA for the invitation. You know, in days where Professor Okwe was speaker, once the Honorable Majority Leader agrees to something to his right, then accidentally or coincidentally I'm to the left, I agree. My Okwe made it law, he will let it pass because he has built consensus. <laughs> so I intend today that I will emphasize, after a brief introduction, areas to which we can appear as a country to have built consensus. And then we can proceed on it. But with an assurance to this gathering that an overhaul of the 1992 Constitution remains an imperative and is compelling. And therefore, it is my strongest view that we should walk the talk 
and go beyond the rhetorics of everyday discussion of constitutional review. Many countries over the world have attempted constitutional review. Some have achieved remarkable results. The success story of the constitution of the Kenya Review Committee, which happened in 2010, can guide us. But since the birth of the 1992 constitution on 7 January 1993, there has been no shortage of calls for reforms to be made to some of its provisions. Yet over the past three decades, there has only been one major successful amendment to the constitution, which was in 1996, among other things, which allowed citizens to still retain their citizenship, even where they acquired citizenship of another state. Apart from that, all other attempts at constitutional amendment have either stalled or failed. Professor Chairman, my is that beyond what Professor J. E. Mills did in 2010, putting together the Fiajo Committee to look at the 1992 Constitution and the way forward, what we should be doing now as a country is to constitute a constitutional review implementation committee chaired, co-chaired by the president and any other respected person in Ghana of good democratic standing who will help the president work the processes, whether it is entrenched or non-entrenched. Then, arguably, we can begin to give meaning to aspects of our constitutional review process. Members of this constitutional implementation committee can be drawn from academia, civil society, political parties, experienced jurists, former speakers of parliament, former season members of parliament, one or two surviving members of the constituent assembly and the constitutional review committee can still provide some useful experience. I believe that is the way we should be going. Now, as I said, I intend to guide the building of consensus. So where I agree with the majority leader, the emphasis will be mine. So I'll pick a few constitutional articles he has referred to and emphasize it for our purpose. Currently before Parliament, we are assessing and evaluating Supreme Court judges for appointment to the Supreme Court of Ghana pursuant to the present mandate under Article 144 of the Constitution. As leader rightly referred to, Article 128 provides for a minimum of nine no maximum. My contention is we should have a maximum of 13. From present Rawlings through present J. Kufu, through late Atam Mills, through John Mahama, we have stayed within. So for the first hearing, the same constitution in 128 through 129 provides for five, and it can be extended to nine. But because the Supreme Court is not bound by its decision and can review its decision, you can expand from five to nine. So if you add some four to nine, you get 13. So you can even do a judicial review with a maximum of 13 Supreme Court judges. And I think that as a country, we should have a maximum ceiling. We should not leave it at the level where any president can come and be assured that if my president come today, I'll encourage him to populate the Supreme Court. I will. And when you, when you say, when you ask what he is doing, I'll say it's consistent with the Constitution and his powers under the Constitution. So, leader, I'm at a day with you on that. Now, for emphasis again, I pick again, leader, for us to build consensus. Article 78. Ministers of state shall be appointed by the president with prior approval of parliament. Maximum majority of ministers should come from parliament, so 50 plus one. So when even we are assessing members of parliament who are nominated ministers and non-members of parliament who are nominated ministers like my accountant professor, 
uh, Tuya, who is now Deputy Attorney General, the attitude is different because he's already an elected member of parliament, having been recognized by the president. Can you even disqualify him? If you disqualify him, are you disqualifying him not even to be a member of parliament? Because if he is disqualified legally and you think it's fatal that he cannot be minister, then that person cannot be member of parliament. Because to qualify to be minister, you must qualify to be member for parliament. So read 94 well and probably we would need to look at it. My view again, Speaker Chairman, is the number of ministers and I think that one of the reasons why the 1992 constitution needs a review, I'm sharing my experience as a lawmaker and as former cabinet minister, is parliament's failure to hold the executive accountable and parliament's failure to allow for a semblance functional operation of separation of powers and checks and balances. Wherever the constitution has given the power and mandate to parliament, parliament has filled this republic. And by parliament, I mean from 1993 to yesterday. And we have failed because of intense partisanship, excessive partisanship. I'm sure leader didn't want to tell you when he said he's become a fire tender or fire officer this morning. This morning, I decided to file a motion of censor on the Minister of Finance. Interestingly, I started my journey yesterday, and he was adequately informed by 2 p.m. yesterday that I will invoke Article 82. This morning, I saw members of his party amounting to 80, whether he calls them rebels or coup makers. <laughs> Take the wind out of my sleeves that they support it. What they didn't know is that they have encouraged me that I can now get the minimum threshold to unseat and exit the Minister for Finance. But probably I hesitated because of it. But what makes it imperative for this evening meeting is that I understand that none of the 80 is a minister. So it means if we are on our own, we can be on our own as members of parliament. And we, to the extent that we are independent and autonomous, we can function well. Now two, the fear and respect of the president by members of parliament. So back to my argument, I sincerely also think that this country uh, must run with a maximum of 65 ministers. I don't think that the elephant size of uh, the government from 2017 to 2020 was acceptable anyway. Neither do I think that previously those expanded numbers. And those of you who are legal experts, you can examine as leader attempted Article 79 well, when it says that there shall be a cabinet constituted by the president, the vice president, and not more than 19 ministers. So you say 19 ministers with their deputies. So I'll even increase it to 20. So that's 40 ministers. If you are regional ministers, you are somewhere around 50. Then the president, at his pleasure, can appoint other ministers. But you see, that one, it is parliament which has failed. We should tell every president that don't exceed the ceiling. But we haven't done that. So whether that requires a constitutional amendment or not may not be an issue if parliament was authoritative enough and exercised a new its weight and might to say that don't bring us any number other than 65. Probably others can even reduce the number and if parliament was strong and firm. So when I hear president say that they are mindful of public peace, that mindfulness must reflect in the size of government, my strong view. When you say I'm mindful of public peace, that mindfulness must reflect in the size and composition of government. And then again, Professor Chairman, I agree with leader but I want to take it on a different route. He refers to Article 195 of the Constitution, where the President appoints chief executive officers of state-owned enterprises. Uh, he works with the Constitution even if he's in Zambia. I don't have my copy. But if you read 195 well, it says the President shall appoint them 
in consultation with the governing council. That has never been respected by many presidents. You are there and you hear that a chief executive officer has been appointed. The chairman of the board and the governing council is even unaware of it and is asked to ratify it or asked to support it or he himself has been asked to go home if he disagrees with the president. <laughs> so Article 195 needs a review. But again, is it an amendment or the president respecting the letter and spirit of the law. It says do so in consultation with the governing council. And those of you who have studied corporate governance, let the board be the appointing authority and not the president. If even the president, he should only do so on the advice of the governing council. So that would be my disagreement with you on 195, and I think that we can build consensus on that. Now that leads me to another area where the nation can build consensus. If he reflects his party view, and I reflect my party view, will be Article 187. The Auditor General, he says he's to be part of parliament. But before I address that, let me address an insignificant issue again, leader raised. Ghana's asset declaration regime, who does it serve? Who does it serve? And for what purposes has it been helpful to our country? Until civil society tested the law, even on the Auditor General in court, probably the essence of an asset declaration regime was to match income to property acquisition and to allow for a process where we can make a determination that assets so declared reflect the earnings and commensurate income of the person. So our asset declaration regime have not helped Ghana's quest to fight corruption. And therefore, if we want to succeed in our journey on making corruption a high-risk activity, a complete overhaul of our asset declaration regime becomes necessary. It is my addition, considered view that probably we should behave like the United Kingdom. Even when it comes to declared assets, we should go for reverse burden of proof. If we find you, you have property and assets and gold bars bigger than what you should be earning, you must prove. It shouldn't be the state we should prove. You must prove how you got that income. So if you wake up and we find six million CDs in an account of a minister or an MP, ah, which earning can give you six million? Which earning? Which earning? Yet you are comfortable and proud that you have millions in your account. Where is that money come from? It can only come from loot. Save on justified grounds. That's why the Constitution says that office of profit, so that we know that you are earning additional money from some engagement in other economic commercial activities to which you are entitled to those earnings. So I share leaders' view that our asset declaration regime needs a comprehensive review. National Development Planning Commission, even as we speak today, Ghana, Labor, take labor. We want to know what human capital we want to develop for our country. Therefore, we should be able to do a focus. In the next 10, 25 years, what category of persons is Ghana training? Are they in the sciences? Are they in the areas of innovation? Or they are your traditional history, religion, and philosophy of our universities which has not changed? We must ask that question. And therefore, the National Development Planning Commission should be able to do an economic focus and tell us what our labor market needs will be and for our universities to reflect it. So I think that the National Development Planning Commission, where you have ministers of state serve it, I agree with him again that let's review the constitution, make it independent. And then uh, 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 I like to emphasize this. Recall that again, uh, 
between 2010 and 2016 under the National Democratic Congress, at least when the Constitutional Review Committee is set up by a present mill sample views from Ghanaians nationwide on the operation of the 1992 Constitution and on the changes that need to be made to the Constitution. The government issued a white paper. So we ask ourselves, beyond the white paper, what happened? Again, Parliament, you see the presence, each of them come, deliver State of the Nation address, no comment on constitutional review. That amounts to no commitment to constitutional review. If in your State of the Nation address, you don't hint at it. Rather, and don't even provide an elaborate roadmap as to what you want to be able to deal with it. Now, Professor Chairman, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Ghana has been touted as a torchbearer of democracy in Africa, and particularly in South Africa, will become a beacon of hope. In spite of this, Ghana's core in the world democracy rankings have seen a sank, as is this my record in recent times show. For example, the Economist Intelligence Unit 2020 Democracy Report places Ghana in the basket of flawed democracies, now ranking safe in sub-Saharan Africa and 56 best in the world. This is a significant drop from the country's 2017 record of fourth in sub-Saharan Africa and 52nd place worldwide when their MPP assumed the rings of uh, power in 2017. The Democracy Index provides a snapshot of the state of democracy for countries worldwide. Again, VDEMS 2021, the Liberal Democracy Index, classifies Ghana as the fifth best in Africa and 52nd best internationally. This too represents a drop from its 46th position in 2017. Again, in 2022, reported a downgrade of Ghana from a liberal democracy to electoral democracy over the years. And again, we should be concerned that citizens in whom sovereignty rests, are they happy with us? Are they satisfied with us? Are we ourselves not, with our performance, undermining their faith in democracy and its associated dividends? So the second probably significant attempt to address the election date of 7 December, you remember, when we try changing the name, chairperson of the Electoral Commission, you are here. Uh, sometimes you see the political class, when he's in government, some things he's happy with. When I'm in opposition, some things and I'm happy with. The reverse is equally true. When in opposition, I see some things right, and he doesn't see them right again, because he's in government. Part of Ghana has been why you need a constitutional uh, amendment. Now, the other attempt at constitutional amendment was under President Nana Adudanko, 2018-2019, which was an amendment to Article 2431, introducing multi-party elections and politics at local government level. And get it right, the NDC supports the principle of an electoral MMDCS. What we have problems with is probably one, who will supervise that election? And when I say who will supervise, when you undertake assembly elections, it's supervised and paid for by the state, conducted by the Electoral Commission. If you make it competitive on party lines, your monetization, which has characterized MP election, may also be introduced at the district level election, and that can undermine the decentralization devolution agenda. But in principle, we share the view that it should be elective. Whether it should be on party lines, or it should just be ordinary Ghanaian, with the pretense, we pretend that it's, it's, it's independent, you also can look at that option. But there is a significant national security question there. Pr Professor Chairman, the single ladies and gentlemen that I like to pose, but I hope that I'm not misconstrued tomorrow on this code. If you take some districts, because of ethnic diversity in those areas, the political parties to promote inclusiveness have tried to share member of parliament with DCA, with some other social groups. 
I could give you several examples. Now, if you go on the elective principle, some other groups may never ever get elected to the DCE position. That can undermine the unity and cohesion and the national security of those areas. Uh, probably, Chairman, to give you one example, take Gushegu. Gushegu, the ethnic composition there. You have the Gombes, you have Kukumbes, you have dominant ethnic groups. Sometimes the MP is this ethnic group, the DC is from the other ethnic group. If you are not careful, one group will feel left out. That inclusiveness, an amendment to Article 243 must find a way to address it. For some minority groups to still get recognized. Speaker Chairman, we just returned from IPU, where you used to lead us. Ghana is doing well. Uh, Speaker Bagbin have benefited from some of the work we did collectively with you in Uganda and Kenya. As now uh, president of CPA, with the gentleman to your right now representing the CPA. Again, again, <laughs> my good friend, the leader of government business. Again, Uganda and Kigali praises itself that they are doing well with gender. And Professor, again, today, uh, Speaker Bagwin was talking about affirmative action. Little did he know your effort at Fiesta Royal to get it passed. It doesn't pass. Yet, we say we believe in gender inclusiveness. It requires an amendment to the Constitution. Because our Constitution says, no person shall be discriminated against on the basis of gender. So the men, the women, that's why there must be affirmative action, because we cannot discriminate favorably to you when we don't have an affirmative action legislation in place. But to the success of Kigali, Rwanda, Uganda, it has worked for them having what you call proportional representation. And they appoint other persons to their parliament. So for instance, we could also amend the constitution and decide that each region shall send two women to parliament. We can't. And that would increase the number of women in public political life and public decision-making process. But you cannot do so without tinkering with the 1992 constitution, which says that don't discriminate on the basis of sex. But I share the view that we have to promote more gender inclusiveness in our democratic practice and in our democratic journey. Moderator, as I assured you, I don't intend to match the majority leader with how much time he has spent. Uh, I'll give him some headache elsewhere to compensate for the time. So in conclusion, to avoid the historical development problem of fluctuations and truncations in plans and projects initiated by previous administration. First, Article 87 and 8, 86 and 87 must be amended to have a binding force on whoever forms the government of the day. That is in respect of the National Development Planning Commission. There was call even for an independent emoluments committee we also should not abandon that particular effort, given how much of the country's money go into compensation. Finally, let me conclude with Parliament. Again, when we all say that Parliament is the controller of the public purse, Parliament controls the budget, a constitutional meet. Because every other day, Speaker of Queen, as you remember, even you, You'll be holding a calabash looking for the Honorable Minister for Finance to see how much help he can give to Parliament as an autonomous institution. So when you say that Parliament controls the budget, how do you control a budget and you behave like a toddler who is uh, lactating for the mother's breast? Import the constitutional myth. But I agree again with Lida. When you look at the tenor of Article 179, and the provisions of the budget in respect of the Auditor General and the Judiciary. It says that when the Chief Justice submits the budget of the Judiciary, the words there says, without any revision. But there has always been a revision. 
by successive president. Is that a breach of the constitution or is it because we don't have enough adequate resources? I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Minority Leader Honorable Haruna Idrisu, for honoring your promise to me and also presenting to us an equally invigorating discussion of the Constitution and identifying some uh, gaps in it that require review. Thank you very much. Um, I think at this point we would be inviting questions from among the guests to our our questions and comments to our presenters, and and I think uh, we would uh, take uh, one question at a time. But if there is there is it any a common or follow-up question it could take two or more. I think that we should be careful not to make the constitution the straw man on which we blame all our failings. The constitution has issues. But are we able to think? The constitution doesn't limit the... That doesn't have an upper ceiling for Supreme Court judges. So what do we do? Can't we agree on consensus and have one? They, they, they stated over the years there seems to have been a consensus. And then a government seems to be going about the consensus. Um, a parent can have a conversation with the president say, oh, John, chill, you're going a bit out of the way. And remember that we must approve. And parliament is not bound to give a reason to approve or disapprove. And so if you are going beyond this number, we parliament, whether we are constituted by your party or not, will not grant approval. Do you understand? We, 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 do we need people to line up in the sun to vote for parliament to like as, 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 assert itself? I think, ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of people to blame for the state we are in. But I lay the blame solely or largely on parliament. The constitution says you should pass a property rights bill. It's been 30 years. Parliament, where is it? In the process, you have ceded your legislative power to the Supreme Court, which is happily legislating. Through the accident of cases that come before it, the Supreme Court will legislate and then do amendments. And you're sitting down, you haven't done anything. 30 years is an aspect of our constitution that the premise of the constitution donated to parliament. You have failed and you want an amendment. Article, uh, another article says you should determine what international business and economic transactions are and the circumstances under which approval is required or not required. You haven't done it. In the process, the Supreme Court is legislating. International arbitral tribunals are legislating on our law. Yes, guilty as charged. I, I got them to do a couple of them. And, yes, and Parliament hasn't bothered to look at it. Now, you, if you want to amend something, you must tell us that you have tried everything and it hasn't worked. So let's change it. But when you haven't tried it, how can you tell us that we should amend it? I have, I have more, but you said just one. Um, Article 71. Where does it say, now watch this, Article 71 in my, in my understanding, anticipates that at the beginning of governance, the committee will be set up to determine the terms and conditions going forward. Has this ever happened? That's not the case. It is at the end. And so they look at the circumstances and give themselves a fat back pay and a pension. And so we have twisted it conveniently. Do we need an amendment of the Constitution? I think that of those of us who have the voice or who lead, we are not bound by the law. We want to find smart ways of beating the law. Then you blame the law. Article 71 doesn't say a lot of what we, we say it should do. Independent constitutional bodies. And I know, I mean, I'm in a long standing fight with the Auditor General. I know that Parliament doesn't support some of the things that we have done in trying to hold the Auditor General to account. But I'm sorry, but, um, 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 Honorable Majority Speaker. The Constitution doesn't really make the Auditor General your agent. It doesn't say that. Asking us to submit a report to you does not make you a supervisor. And so the people of Ghana whose money are audited are entitled to know. That is why there's a specific clause granting it independence from you and everybody else, that office, and saying in the same sub-article that granted the independence that it shall issue the allowances and such as. What has happened now is that the current auditor general is frozen. He's waiting for parliament before he does it. His last letter to me is that he's writing a report for parliament. Until then, he won't justify why he says 
he has recovered 2.2 billion, which in RG doesn't exist anywhere. <laughs> now, if Parliament had been treating the reports well, and the Public Accounts Committee wasn't divided by partisanship, we see you on TV, nothing happens. You think we'll be fighting? If you took it on yourself and made sure that the monies are refunded, you think anyone will be fighting? Parliament sat down and passed that even the finance minister should have surcharge powers. That I, I, I did say should to two of, of the public financial management. That has never been exercised. And so when all of these things do not, I know you want to stop me, but please uh, ask, ask, ask me okay not to call me the next time. <laughs> <laughs> Asset declaration, and that's another thing. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, when the constitution says something, Parliament finds interesting ways of defeating it. The constitution says that assets shall be declared before the person is appointed. Parliament sat down and we redefined the word before to mean three months after appointment. I like, where on earth is this possible? When the constitution says before, but before can be interpreted to mean three months after. As a result, people don't declare and nobody chases it. But I thought before would mean that before they appear before you, they have declared and their asset declaration will be before parliament when they are vetted. And so Parliament can ask you questions on your assets. But Parliament sits down and passes a law deferring it. And that law still hasn't been amended. It is waiting cabinet approval. The last time, cabinet says they set up a subcommittee. They set up a subcommittee. Now they say there are more important things. So that bill is still sitting before the cabinet with no approval. Last one, I'll sit down. Last one. Lands. We spoke about lands, public lands. When the constitution gave the lands commission independence, it then gave the, the minister power to issue general policy, written policy of a general nature, which means that the only control that the minister should have of finance commission is general policy approved by the president, not one policy document at the issue. Yet state lands have been retained. Who issued the policy? When the constitution says that, it's been retained, and nobody's asking any questions. Last one. <laughs> last one, last one. Please, next time, don't go. I, I, I'm glad the uh, honorable uh, majority leader mentioned the seven years I for creating constituencies. The electoral commission will tell you that we started harassing them on that issue. What we have is constitutional illegality and clear executive gerrymandering. Because when the seven year cycle is up and the EC alone should have the power to determine constituencies. We have passed a local government and now a local governance act cleverly saying that an MP cannot belong to two district assemblies. And so between the, between the executive and the legislature, as long as they divide districts, when the seven year cycle is up, EC somehow considers itself bound by the stat statute and so will create constituencies to reflect the wishes of the executive. That is gerrymandering. And we are doing that and then blaming the part that the constitution as a strong man. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm one of those who believe that the constitution hasn't failed us. We have failed the constitution. Maybe instead of us amending the constitution, the constitution should amend us. Looking around the room, I'm the only person now who was a member of the consultative assembly 30 years ago. That's how old I am. <laughs> but I was a very young man then and um, so I agree entirely with um, all these points that have been raised. They have been raised over the years and Madam confessed that most of these points were raised before the, the committee, uh, Professor Sophia Joe committee. I agree with the minority leader that what we should be talking about now is an implementation committee. It's an implementation committee where we look at some of this and like it's, it's taught me in law school. Uh -huh. it's what, it's, it's my, I'm older than you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't go to law school as a young man. In fact, I went to law school when I was almost leaving parliament after 12 years. So I was a very senior person. But I can assure you that uh, 5th October this year, my class was 15 years. So I'm a Supreme Court material. <laughs> From 5th of October, we are 15 years, <laughs> and uh, uh, Haruna is 20 years, he's uh, an incoming chief justice. <laughs> anyway, so um, what happened?
was that at the consultative assembly, we did our best. 258 people were there. And today they came to announce to me, I asked somewhere that Nana Kwaminchi uh, had died from a sin. And you know, all the powerful chiefs, he, Nana Boapon, all the powerful chiefs in Ghana then, because each region was to bring a chief, there were 10 of them. And then, in fact, I worked in a committee which Osafoma Fo chaired, because that was the committee that created Commission for Civic Education, Electoral Commission, all the uh, committees. Nana, now who is the Council of State Chairman, was our um, business committee um, chairman. And 258 people out of 260 were in there. But we had a problem. So the technology of the times were not available to us. This whole idea of a proportional representation came up because some of us at the time thought that that was the only way we could we could bring everybody on board. Do you know the argument that defeated it? They said after the election, how could the calculations uh, be made? Can you say that at this time? Where even on your phone, on your phone, within three minutes you can calculate uh, how many people uh, would uh, be provided by a party. So we agreed that there should be amendments. And as somebody said, we should, I think we have talked enough about the amendments. The Fiajo committee is, 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 is comprehensive enough. Let's let this group start thinking about implementation. Because I think there have been some, some people say don't touch the constitution at all. But even those of us who made it 30 years ago knew that there should be amendments. So procedures were made for those amendments to be. It's true that the, the, it's a little rigid, uh, particularly the, the entrenched clauses. But we can put a few of them, of them together and do the referendum once, or even do a referendum to amend the amended uh, version. So I would, I would think that we should put up an implementation committee to implement whatever is there. Enough has been said about it. And like A said, some of the issues we talk about, it's not about the Constitution. It's about ourselves. It's about ourselves. Why should we have 18? In fact, the judge that appeared before the committee the other time even says that we need about 25 uh, uh, Supreme Court judges. And we can make it 30 when, when, when. So, but, so it's about ourselves. We should stop doing some of the things we are doing. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, I came here because of the gender factor and I knew that we the most uh, the two most powerful people in Parliament will be here today to be able to listen to us um, you said um, if the Constitution is not amended what it means is that um, we will continue to have gender disparities among us I don't think so because when you look at the Constitution article 17 4 says that when we have differences in political, social, economic situation in the country, parliament should enact laws to solve those differences. So for parliament to say that they cannot solve those differences because Article 17.3 is saying that no one should be discriminated upon, I think that as my brother has said, the constitution has provided the way, and if we want to do the right thing, we can do the right thing. In fact, the directive principles of state uh, policy, Article 35, 6B, um, says that whenever we are going to do appointments, recruitments, um, the appointing uh, person, especially into public positions, should try to make sure that they, they put on gender lenses what that is, when that is being done. In the country, when you look at the um, Labor Commission said the public sector, they have employed 87% of men and 13% of women. This is against the constitution of Ghana. So we don't need to come up with new laws, thinking about reforms, when the ones that we already have in the uh, constitution, we are not obeying them. In fact, um, conventions, treaties, when you look at the treaties that we have, like uh, the Beijing uh, uh, this in uh, declaration, we talk about uh, this in Sidao, uh, that's a convention on the discrimination of all forms of what and what against women. Then we talk about the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. All these things were accepted by Ghana, signed, and they are, uh, they are what they are, they, are, they, are, they are legal binding. But still, we are not doing anything to help the gender factor. So I think that Parliament should do something about the affirmative action that they have brought to eat those steps. Passing it 
It needs both the two political parties that have representation in parliament. And I've never heard any of them speaking in support of the affirmative action bill. Yet, uh, uh, I think the majority leader is the vice uh, um, chairman of, uh, is it Pal uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association? And they just, South Africa just brought a bill about gender uh, something and you have accepted it. If it is accepted there, let us also do something so that here affirmative action bill will be passed. If not that, in your regime, you pass it somewhere, but in your own country, there's no any affirmative action bill. I, I don't think it's right. Thank okay. you. First, to agree with the minority leader with respect to um, the issue about proportional representation. Truth is, um, We've tried this at the outset in 19, 1997. And my party um, entered into an alliance with some minority parties in the lead up to the 1996 elections. And then I remember somebody went and sat somewhere and said, well, um, Ashanti, we have safe seats for the M MPP, so let's as filled as many women as possible. And the one who was part of that decision cited Swami. So let's go and put a lady at Swami. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was also representing one of the Kumasi constituencies. So I asked, when I had opportunity, why not begin with your constituency? You want to begin with Swami. Point is, if we don't legislate the issue about proportional representation, it will be difficult for us. And let's face it. In all the countries that practice the first past the post system, you don't have women representation in parliament. The paucity of women representation in parliament begins with the jurisdictions that practice first past the post. Those of them that we cite are practicing proportional representation, or in some instances, um, women deliberately are appointed to parliament. Beside the case of Rwanda, and you and I know that a huge segment of the, the women population in parliament, they are directly appointed by the president. Would Ghanaians accept that? Uganda, the same thing applies. Would Ghanaians accept that? That's why I'm saying that I agree with the minority leader that uh, we should legislate this. Otherwise, it will be difficult to, you know, uh, death your trust on the goodwill of political parties. You will not deliver. Because um, the, the, if, even if it happens in the voting region, uh, where the NDC is strongest. The MPP perhaps would say that oh, we agree with you. We put up women knowing very well that you are going to occupy all the places in the event. So I think that we should legislate this. The um, ACE, I agree with you that Parliament should be asserting itself. How do we assert ourselves? Given the extreme polarization in Parliament, especially in our current circumstances, no amount of preaching will heal any wounds. You may agree here between the minority there and I, in principle that, oh, okay, this is good. Let them recline to their caucuses. Their caucuses will not agree. So I, I believe that, yes, I was talking about the number of men. If we don't legislate it, it'll be difficult. Because if there is a John Mahama who makes the determination, and he has a sizable majority in parliament, they certainly would do the bidding of the president. No two ways about that. If there is an Akufuado president who also um, you know, goes beyond the ceiling um, and it comes to parliament and we have a comfortable majority, nobody would challenge the president's um, you know, decision. That's, that's being pragmatic, it's a fact of life. There shouldn't be any pretensions about that. So I guess if we inscribe this in the Constitution, the better for us. The President appoints ministers to, uh, uh, you know, um, nominates ministers to certain positions. Parliament vests them for those positions. And some of them, in some instances, after vetting, after Parliament has approved of them, the President in swearing them in decides that you will not take you to the, the sector where I nominated you for. I nominated you for Ministry of Roads, but Parliament has approved of you for that position. The President then decides to make him a regional minister. 
who, who, who raised any issue? Because at that time, the party in power then had a comfortable majority in power, not a comfortable lead. You had a comfortable majority. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are matters that should concern us. Um, I agree that there are some others that are long outstanding. For instance, whereas the Constitution provides that after the promulgation of the Constitution, that is in Article 22, what is the what is the language, Minority Leader? Article 22.2, the spousal rights. What is it? What's the language? As soon as practicable. When Parliament is not, it's taking us 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. I agree with you. We keep referring to this. Even today, there was something else that we we're discussing. It has to do with what to do with reports that come from the Auditor General. The Constitution provides that we should set up a committee to deal with malfeasance. 30 years, we haven't done that. 30 years, we haven't done that. So we, we cannot, you know, exonerate ourselves from blame. But it's, I, I part ways with you uh, when you deal with uh, what purpose or which authority the Auditor General is supposed to serve. Check, and I agree, if you want to be technical, that our constitution does not really place the Auditor General um, you know, under parliament. Everywhere else, in all other constitutions, the Auditor General is a working tool for parliament. It is, but unfortunately, however it happened, our constitution, and that is why I say that, even though it's supposed to work to parliament, Parliament has no authority to direct its attention to suspected cases of malfeasance. The executive that is being investigated by Parliament is rather giving the authority to direct the Auditor General to investigate certain suspected malfeasance, but not Parliament. In my view, that is an aberration. That is the issue that I address. The, I agree with you, the one relating to the um, Article 1815, that is loans, that we should have um, Parliament to provide the necessary modifications relating to um, domestic loans. We haven't done that. Again, every now and then, we are raising this in Parliament. Just as we did, the Auditor General, they had that one, we did so today in Parliament. And I was telling the minority leader that I clearly remember that it was under the chairship, the proper accounts under the chairship of the current minister for national security, Kandapa. It was his time that this matter came up to the fore. And then we interrogated it and we said to ourselves that you no, know, we needed to have a committee established on the lines of a commission of inquiry to have a justice of the court or the superior court to chair. There was this discussion with the then uh, chief justice, Justice. Uh, Justice Georgina Wood. We didn't finish. That tenure lapsed, and that was the end of it. That is Parliament. And I was telling him that it is not that simplistic. We have to go back through and get it, uh, get that co committee erected. Because there are so many things that should concern us if we want to improve our governance. As for Article 71, it's an overflogged matter. I don't want to deal with it. The point really is this. I agree with you that. The day after the swearing in of the president, this committee must be established. <laughs> but which president has balls in, in, in between uh, somewhere who would have the courage to establish that committee the day after the swearing in? <laughs> People who say that ah, this man is a self seeker. So presidents will have to deal with labor issues once they are sworn in. So they have to wait necessarily until a certain time. It's not as if they give themselves fat activities, uh, but they are entitled to reasonable emolument. That is in the lighter side. But I think that the, the issue, I think that we should have not this committee established ritualistically, but we should come to some agreement that is established by uh, one president. How do we build in the necessary triggers so that the next succeeding president doesn't have to establish the committee again? So we move on. To me, that should be how it should be done. As to the time of establishment and so on and so forth, all of them 
uh, have proved to be, um, you know, Tim Russell's when it comes to the establishment of, <laughs> of um, the committee under Article 71. Mr. Chairman, um, the, the minority that will carry on from there, and if you may indulge me, uh, it appears to me that I've not yet succeeded in uh, killing the uprising that he started. Uh, so <laughs> they are calling and calling. So I have to leave you. But I think that we have we have at least done sufficiently well to justify our inclusion. Yeah. I intend to respond just to three issues. Is I could agree more with you. Today it came out strongly in Parliament that Parliament has failed in getting the spousal rights bill passed. 30 years on, there can be no justification. Similar to the affirmative action bill, but to tell my lady friend that effort have been made, Professor Okwe is here, he will recall even a day when he directed me to go to Fiesta Royal for a discussion, and his instructions were firm. Mr. Minority Leader, I need conclusion for affirmative action bill to be introduced. We went up till now, it has not been introduced. But is since you are my senior in the law, with respect, Professor Chairman, I have to refer is Ankuma to Article 1876, so that when you get home, you will digest it further and understand why the Auditor General may be behaving the way he's behaving and why Parliament may be behaving the way we are behaving, even as it's unacceptable. 187, 1875 reads, so I'll do five and six. The Auditor General shall within six months after the end of the immediately preceding financial year to which each of the accounts mentioned in clause two of this article relates, submits his report to Parliament and shall in that report draw attention to any irregularities in the accounts audited and to any other matter which in his opinion ought to be brought to the notice of Parliament. Now my emphasis is six, why is seven six, it reads, Parliament shall debate the report of the Auditor General and appoint where necessary in the public interest a committee to deal with any matters arising from it. Please, so, sir. Please, sir. Please, sir. As you ask, sir. Please, sir. In the performance of his functions under this constitution or any other law, the Auditor General shall not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority. So that's autonomy. B. May disallow any item of expenditure which is contrary to law and surcharge. No, no, you you are interpreting it. You are interpreting it. No, yes. no and I say fine. No, you see. No, there's no question. When you are speaking, I listen to you anyway. Yes. So, so anyway, it's not don't like it. So the lacuna to borrow Professor Quay's word is whether when Parliament hasn't appointed this committee in the public interest, the Auditor General can proceed to do the things you've suggested. I'm just saying food for thought. I'm not disagreeing with you, but the same constitution says that when the public account submits its report, Parliament shall debate it and appoint a committee. You can ask the public, even today, go and watch the news and read the answer. I raise it today. This is the seventh time I raise this matter, that let's get the committee constituted. So at least we are behaving responsibly. But understand, understand what I'm saying, that Parliament have debated the report. It has not appointed the committee that the constitution says it should do. So that is where we think there's a quagma. I don't seek to have the answers. Article 181, I agree entirely with you, and I think that we should get the committee because, and again, uh, Deputy Attorney General, you are here, so you take it food for thought. There are ministers who go to commit the Republic, even without passing through the Attorney General office. My view is that that is wrong, because there are consequences to the action, and the international transactions that they commit to, which comes to the state as financial consequence. So I agree with you that we should deal with it. Now, on Electoral Commission, without referring to the chairperson who is here, my view is that Article 43 should be amended and you should have commissioners 
who are representative of political parties. In the name of transparency, that can be done. You can have a chair of the Electoral Commission, and you can have other commissioners who represent the political parties at the commission. It's done in many other democracies and many other jurisdictions. So, so the, the, the deputy commissioners can represent political parties. There's nothing wrong with it. Even civil society can have a seat there. Because what is elections about? It's about the electorate and it's about transparency. Now, Ace raised a significant issue. I couldn't agree more with him. Sal, the lack of representation of Sal is a clever executive gerrymandering. But you say gerrymandering, you are referring to me that Auditor General shall not be subject to the direction and control. The Electoral Commissioner on Sal acted as if she was under the direction of the executive. I'm just telling you, that was wrong. That's the Electoral Commission acted in SAD, how come that they don't have a representative? Because somebody said he was respecting an executive fiat of the creation of a district, which confused you where to place this constituency. And again, Prof, 2005, you were then deputy speaker, I hope I'm right. When the MPP administration, President Kufu, brought the bill to introduce National Identification Authority, is yes, you can read the hands up. I, tell, I told them, don't create a new bureaucracy. Leave it to the Electoral Commission. If you go, you can go to the debate. So me and I, I said, no, you don't need a new bureaucracy. Today we have been told by Electoral Commission that we want to depend on NIA ID cards. So what happened to your biometric ID cards as a commission? Can't I raise a question? Was it not the same bio data you collected? So there are issues, but I think that even the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, the nomination and appointment must be with prior approval of parliament so that the person carries all of us along. That's not to suggest that I don't know the background of GMS are going to Electoral Commission. At least I know her contribution to Ghana's democratic evolution. As I said, I used to work very closely with the IEA. But whether or not she is doing the bidding of who appointed her, I can't answer that today. <laughs> I can't answer that today. So, Professor, I would, <laughs> I would leave it here and thank you once again and think that A's got it right on Article 181. We should look at it. I think that the Electoral Commission should still insulate itself from the executive. And probably this is my opportunity, Professor, to raise it. NIA is subject to ministerial and presidential directive. The Electoral Commission is not subject to that, but one to 45. So when you are now saying that I want to work with NIA, I have every right to raise issues that that is not constitutional because NIA is subject to ministerial regulation and control. Chairperson of Electoral Commission, Electoral Commission, you are not subject to the direction and control of any person or institution, including the president. I can't see you for NIA. So for NIA, the president this night can demand that bring your data <laughs> and they may comply. He cannot do so to easy. If he does, we will take him to court and say that he's encroaching your independence and autonomy. On that note, Professor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. With regard to the number of independent state institutions, the president does not appoint. The president nominates. Parliament approves. And that culminates into an appointment. It should be very clear, appointed by the president, appointed by the president. Parliament, the president only nominates. Parliament approves. That process is a one plus one that has to do. And it culminates into an appointment. That's how we have the electoral commissioner or the church commissioner and those other persons. And I'd be glad if my good friend take note of that kind of situation. I want to also make it clear that a lot of water has passed under the bridge since the FIAJO committee. They did a good job. I appeared before it. Nevertheless, it was not the end of wisdom. 
and a number of things have been suggested, including the judiciary and other things, including the capping of ministers at a strike, or ministers from parliament altogether, which also must be taken to serious account. The debate continues. And I think civil society must make more efforts to assist in the process other than some official body. These official bodies sometimes are not the best in, in, the, in this particular kind of circumstance. We have a very beautiful um, calendar before us. Justice in the short comes next week. Excessive powers of the president. Honorable Sam Okudeto follows the 1992 constitution and very exhaustive proposals for, for amendment. Then, Professor Ernest Kofi Abuchi, the following week, development and constitutionalism, building a trusteeship that works and benefits citizens. Very, very interesting is going to be because issues relating to natural resources and how we, con we will manage them or control them and we tighten the screws are all going to be discussed in this regard. The following week, the 22nd, the, uh, the IEA moves to President Kufour's residence where we shall look at the reflections of the only surviving full-term server of the presidency. And it, it's going to be very exciting, including very important recommendations on the Council of State. When you hear that, you will know that there's still more to continue to think about in terms of our constitutional development. Justice Alan Brobe follows over here with local government chieftaincy and the actual workings of these areas of governance with reference to the constitutional arrangement. Justice Sophia Kufu, retired Chief Justice, comes the following week to look at the judiciary as a whole, including matters of to cap or not to cap. And it's interesting to note that if you're going to cap, then are you going to make continue to maintain the Supreme Court as the final court of appeal in the land, which has been enshrined in the Constitution by way of the Ghanaian's right to appeal on every matter to the Supreme Court? You want to cap like America. But in America, the, the Supreme Court does not automatically have all manner of land cases and so on and so forth coming before them on appeal. And if that is going to happen, then of course we should consider amending that aspect of the Constitution which makes it automatic for you to have a right of appeal to the Supreme Court. This was not, a, this was not so some time ago. And the Court of Appeal was at one time the highest Court of Appeal in Ghana. So shall we maintain that? so that we leave the Supreme Court as a constitutional court, essentially, and for that matter, limited number of judges. These are all relevant issues that go beyond merely wishing that there should be a limited number of judges. Then, the following week, gender unconstitutionalism. So those beautiful matters on gender will be seriously exhausted on 13th December at the IEA, and that is where we end the year. The following year, we shall have Dr. Kusibotu here in January, latter part of January, speaking on the economy, natural resources, and generally law in aid of development. How do we apply the, the law as enshrined in the Constitution to ensure that our natural resources are not abused by any government whatsoever. This should tell you that uh, the IE has thought out a serious program. And we trust that a number of views will come out from different so sources, not one committee, which can be looked at by anybody 
that will uh, ultimately want to work on constitutional change. We thank you very much for your coming, and I'll say this to end my comments. Thank you. Like I said before, your views will be very paramount to the process of constitution review that is the project of the IEA. Thank you very much and see you next week.